Hello, good evening. Uh, we are called the Tamil Ilam uh, Radio. It's now recording a conversation with Lorenzo about trans, uh, transnational governments uh, documentation, which has been submitted to ICC for access to Tamil Ilam area by ICC. So uh, Lorenzo will explain to us what it is all about, about the document, and we will be looking at the document later on and what in, it, it contains. And then what are the possibilities of ICC replying or ICC making this uh, the case which we have put forward a reality. So Ronald, say you can say to us what is this exercise all about? Absolutely, thank you very much, Manivana Nana. So uh, I'll just start by very, very br briefly explaining who I am and what my background is uh, for those who don't know me. Um, I uh, was born in Canada uh, to a, a Tamil mother and an Italian Canadian father. Um, I don't speak Tamil, uh, but uh, I am very passionate about the Tamil cause, uh, which I have been ever since 2009. That was uh, a life-changing moment for me. Um, it was during that time that I decided to go to law school. Um, I'm uh, now completing my barrister training studies uh, here in London in the UK. Um, I've also participated in uh, human rights sessions in Geneva. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit of the background that I'm bringing to the table here. Um, now, uh, speaking about the document itself, um, this grows out of uh, a specific uh, legal theory, um, which is now uh, seen to be the mainstream theory in international law, which is that when a state is occupied, it does not lose its sovereignty, not even when it uh, does not have a government. An occupied state is still a state in inter international law. Um, this is uh, first put forward by James Crawford, and that's on the first page of our document. Um, but it goes back a lot further than that. Um, back in the 1930s, uh, there was a convention, a treaty that was signed between a few Latin American states and the United States, uh, which said that even before recognition, the state has the right to defend itself, to administer its uh, courts and justice, to provide for its own prosperity. Um, and all you need to be a state is you don't need recognition. You need a permanent population, territory, government, and the capacity to enter into relationships with other states. So one of the things that this document shows is that Tamil Ilam has all four of these components. Um, it is more complicated than that, but uh, that's the very simple uh, basics. You have these four conditions and you're a state, you do not need recognition. And even when you are militarily occupied, you do not lose statehood, not even if there is no government representing you. So uh, Tamil Ilam is a state in law. Uh, this concept is different from a nation, which is a, a, a political term, um, where you can say that a nation is the people and the state is the government. Uh, this is the, the way that people usually think about uh, nations and states. In law, the people is the unit that has the right of self-determination. When they decide that they are a state, that is their decision. It is with their consent that the state is formed, and it is only with their consent that the state can be dissolved. Um, so that's the background. Uh, then walking through the document, uh, we have the first page, which is the declaration. I'll, I'll bring the documents up now. Right. And, uh, yeah, you can continue to talk. All right, uh, so we have the first page, uh, which is the uh, declaration of uh, Tamil Ilam's accession to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is uh, the page uh, that was signed by uh, 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 Rudrana, uh, our prime minister. Um, that would be page three in the document that you're looking at. So can we go through this uh, this pages? What other documents include here? Yes. Okay. So the first three, uh, the, the the yeah, it has got declaration of state of Tamil Nadu ascending the jurisdiction of International Criminal Court on the page three, and the Tamil Nadu has a de jure state uh, ascending uh, 
the ICC jurisdiction territory on the four. And uh, yeah, can you explain to us about the de jure state? Yes. So um, this is uh, the, the Latin legal term for in law. We've heard the term de facto state. And actually, this is, again, a political term. In politics, when a state is not recognized, but it still exercises some degree of independence, it is often re referred to as a de facto state. In law, this distinction doesn't make sense. Either you are a state or you are not. Either you have the four conditions that make you a state, or you're lacking one of those four conditions or more. Um, so what we have shown is that we have those four conditions, and in law, de jure, Tamililam is a state. Okay. And then it talks about the Tamililam de jure state ascending to Jitsano territory and the Tamililam ancient historic and legal territory of his community. And then it talks about the flags of Tamil sovereigns in Ulam. And in, then on the 13th, the Tamil Ulam's reservation to uh, sovereignty. And then on the 16, the re restoration and reconstitution of Tamilam by exercise of self determination. Can you just explain a little bit on that? Uh, yes. So um, I, I can begin, I guess, with the uh, actual document of accession. Um, the wording of this document is taken directly from uh, other states that have acceded to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Uh, notably Ukraine. Um, and uh, there are a few others that have also done this. We looked at a few different models and we made sure that the wording was the same. One thing that we made sure to include is that we want to uh, uh, the jurisdiction of the ICC to cover all four crimes that uh, uh, fall under the jurisdiction of the ICC. So these crimes, uh, we know the first three very well, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. The fourth is aggression. Uh, aggression is the crime of uh, invading one state by another. And uh, there's been some recent movement uh, on that in the case law of the ICC, which uh, had not been made uh, when we wrote this document. Um, however, uh, we want to be clear that uh, the state of Tamililam was invaded by Sri Lanka. It was a sovereign entity, a sovereign state, that was invaded by Sri Lanka. This was not simply a civil war. It's far more complicated than that. Then uh, I'll move on to the ancient historic and original legal title to territory and state continuity. So these three terms, ancient title to territory, historic title, and original title, are three ways of talking about a territorial claim that goes back uh, into ancient times. Um, one of the key cases on this was uh, when Singapore and Malaysia had a dispute at the ICJ over who owned a certain uh, island. And they went back into the pre-colonial history of that island to show that before uh, any colonizer took control of this particular island, uh, whether that was the British or the Portuguese or whoever, in ancient times, this was owned by the Sultanate of Johor. And the Sultanate of Johor was succeeded uh, by, if I remember correctly, uh, by the, the uh, government of Singapore. So um, there was this link between a modern day government and a pre-colonial government on the same territory. Um, the, the ICJ recognized the modern day government's title to that territory based on the fact that there was continuity between the Sultanate of Johor and if I'm remembering cor correctly, between the, uh, the government of Singapore. So this is the, uh, the, the same concept that, that we're talking about when we talk about reversion to sovereignty. Reversion to sovereignty is an argument that Sri Lanka used at the United Nations to say that it is not a new state. Um, it was a state that was re-emerging from its colonial past. But what it left out uh, when uh, Sri Lanka made this argument at, at the United Nations was that there were three kingdoms on the island. Ceylon was not one single entity at that time. In the south, you had the kingdoms of Kandy and Kota. In the north was the kingdom of Jaffnapatam, which uh, had taken over from the Chola Empire even before that. 
Um, so when Ceylon made this argument, they made it incorrectly. They created a, a, a historical fiction saying that the entire island was one kingdom, when in fact, the, uh, the Tamil kingdom before colonization was its own uh, independent entity. The borders of that Tamil kingdom are the borders of Tamil Ilam today. Um, and we see that both in the maps as well as uh, in the historical record that's provided in the Bhaktikote resolution. So um, that brings us then to re restoration and reconstitution of Tamil Ilam uh, by the exercise of the right of self-determination. One of the key things for us in this document is that the right of self-determination does not solely decide that Tamil Ilam is an independent state. Even without the right of self-determination, we still have legal arguments that show Tamil Ilam is its own sovereign state. However, that sovereignty was confirmed in the elections of 1977, when the Tamil United Liberation Front ran on a platform saying that a vote for the TULF is a vote for Tamil Ilam. Um, the people of Tamil Ilam voted overwhelmingly to restore and reconstitute their ancient Tamil state. Um, so at no time from the first colonizer in 1619, through the British merger in 1833, through 1948 independence, through the Republican Constitution of 1972, in these hundreds of years of history, there was never any Tamil consent to any of this. So as I said at the beginning, consent decides when a state is formed and when it dissolves. There has never been Tamil consent to dissolve the state of Tamil Ilam at any time in the 400 years since 1619. Um, then we have uh, the uh, uh, fact, the, the, uh, the, the legal fact, that the LTTE became the government of Tamil Ilam. And this is because the sovereign people consented to be ruled by the LTTE as its representative. In, in uh, our wording, we've used the wording authentic representative. Um, and this is uh, through the, the time of the Indo Lanka Accord when several armed groups were competing for this status. Um, but all but one of the non-LTTE groups ultimately joined the Sri Lankan government. The fourth group joined the LTTE. And this left only two sides. Um, so when the sovereign people said that we want Tamil Ilam, when they said that we want to be defended against Sri Lanka's military aggression against us, they backed the LTTE as the only force that could defend them. And that was the only force that was willing to defend them. Um, moving forward then, uh, international recognition of statehood and Tamil Ilam's policies. Uh, the recognition that we're speaking of is that uh, extended by Chandrika Kumaratunga uh, in a, an interview to the Hindu. I believe the date was April 11th, 2003, if I'm not mistaken. So this was during the ceasefire period. Uh, where she said that the LTT has established a de facto separate state in the North and East. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, this wording de facto state is not a legal term. It's a political term. But when we read Article 7 of the Montevideo Convention, it says that recognition may be express or tacit. Express recognition is when you exchange diplomats. You say, uh, I will set up an embassy in your country, you set up an embassy in mine, and we conduct our relationship that way. Tacit recognition is only when you have the intention of recognizing the state. And once you've recognized the state, Article 6 of the Montevideo Convention says you cannot withdraw recognition. So Sri Lanka has recognized Tamil Ilam. It's a part of the historical record. Um, destruction of government, government and belligerent occupation did not destroy Tamil Ilam. That goes back to the concept I was speaking about at the beginning. Uh, this is uh, uh, under uh, James Crawford's uh, notion that when a government is destroyed or when a state is militarily occupied, this does not destroy the state. That's because the people are the sovereign of the state. Again, without consent, there is no destruction of the state. Tamil Ilam has never been destroyed. Um, and we have then the maps to prove this. Um, so map one is taken from The Economist. Um, that's done in, uh, in grayscale. One so, minute, I'll, I'll bring all right. the map up here. All right. So the, the, the first map uh, uh, 
in the print version, it's done in grayscale. In the version that you have, it's in color. So uh, this is the original version that was published in uh, uh, The Economist. Hold on a second. No trouble at all. You talked about so many, so many other things before. So before the map is, this is what. Yeah, got the that's right. Yeah. yeah, this is the map, yeah. There we go. So um, this map was published in The Economist uh, during the ceasefire period. Um, and and uh, this shows very clearly the area claimed as Tamil homeland with the name Elam on it. Um, and uh, I, I put as a caption just above that uh, a quote from another um, Economist article from the, about the same time. Uh, you could uh, scroll to the top uh, um, and you'll see it. It, it says very clearly, uh, in the north, Mr. Prabharan runs a de facto state with its own police force, justice system, and tax regime. Again, you take that back to the Montevideo Convention, and de facto state just means state. Police force, justice system, and tax regime, this is the state making its decisions for itself exactly as international law says that it can. Um, I neglected to mention that uh, the Montevideo Convention is considered in legal terms, customary international law. Uh, what customary international law means is that when even if a state has not signed the treaty, it still applies worldwide. Uh, that's because this is the way that states conduct themselves when they're behaving legally. So unlike uh, the Rome Statute, uh, which you have to sign in order to accept the ICC's jurisdiction, the Montevideo Convention, which defines what a state is, does not need a signature in order to apply. Um, so we could go to the, the second map then. Yeah, this is the first map. So um, this is a map that was put out by uh, the uh, Sri Lankan um, uh, Defense Force. And I put a caption over that, uh, which quotes from the Hindu article that I just mentioned early, uh, earlier, which said that uh, Chandra Kumaratunga has uh, uh, said that the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam has established a de facto separate state in the north and the east. Um, again, de facto state in law is meaningless. However, the, the, the wording um, that uh, Chandrika Kumaratunga used under Article 7 of the Montevideo Convention, this shows tacit recognition. So Sri Lanka has recognized Tamil Elam. And this map that was put out uh, by the uh, Sri Lankan Defense Force, uh, Ministry of Defense, it shows that recognition. Okay. So the yellow ones are controlled by Gosal, claimed by Tamil. That's right. Uh, that is including Jaffna. And then Manar, Vaunia, and uh, Puttalam. And then partially controlled by Gosal and uh, government of Sri Lanka and pockets of controlled by LTT. So these are the areas we have. So this map was published in uh, 2005, is it right? That's about right, yes. Um, the, the exact date uh, isn't listed on my source, but I've okay. uh, included a footnote at the bottom which shows exactly where I got it from. Okay. Right. The third map is a historical map. That's right. This is a British map from about the time that the British first took control of the island. Um, and uh, you can see uh, very clearly that uh, the north and east are separate from the south, uh, using virtually the, the exact same borders as uh, what we saw previously uh, as claimed as the Tamil homeland. Um, and uh, I've, I included here as the, the caption that uh, was in the TOLF election manifesto saying this is the territory of Tamil Elam because Tamil Elam uh, is not an idea that uh, belongs in the future. Tamil Elam is a historical fact that is also a legal fact. Um, and this his history is shown 
visually in this map. So uh, the document makes uh, a, a lot of the historical analysis. It goes through and explains um, exactly why it is so that the pre-colonial state uh, that was that belonged to Tamils is today the territory of Tamil Elam. Um, but the map shows this. It's, it's very visually clear uh, when you compare these three maps that we are talking about the same territory. Okay, we are talking about the same territory. Yeah. Okay, then we are coming to uh, the liberation, uh, so about the Tamil United Liberation Front. Uh, uh, is it the formation of Tamil United Front, uh, liberation TULF in 19, May 1976, as part of the Watakote Resolution, is it right? Yes, so what you're looking at here is uh, uh, TGTE's own introduction. Um, and uh, after this introduction, then uh, we have the Vatukote Resolution, which we all know. We have the TULF Election Manifesto, which we all know. Um, and these documents express the will of the Tamil people uh, that uh, took place during the general election of 1977. Um, so the, the key words uh, were that a vote for the TULF is the vote for Tamil Elam. Um, this means that uh, the 1977 general elections were held as a referendum on Tamil Elam. And we know from the historical record that the people of Tamil Elam voted overwhelmingly to vote, uh, form their own separate state. So this is a, a legally significant moment because it expresses the consent of the Tamil people to re-establish their own state which uh, after uh, the British withdrew from the island, after the 1972 uh, constitution cut the last ties with British colonialism, the, the first move that the Tamil people made was to boycott the Sri Lankan uh, uh, constitution. And the second move they made was to reform their own state. This is very legally significant uh, in terms of what exactly the people have consented to. So this is the resolution, what you call a resolution, uh, right. uh, proclaimed in 14th of May, 1976. And uh, you can read that. And we'll be supplying an audio and we'll uh, put this in the, the, we are loading this to the YouTube. So we will be uh, so putting this uh, document also part of that. This is what they call a resolution. And uh, the highlighted bit is that the first national convention of United Liberation Front meet at Panaham, Patakote constituency, on the 14th of May 1976, hereby declare that Tamils of Ceylon, by virtue of their great language, their religion, uh, and their separate culture and heritage, the history of independent evidence as a separate state over distinct territory for several centuries till they were conquested by the armed might of European invaders and above all, they, uh, by their will to exist as a separate entity, ruling themselves in their own territory are a nation distinct and apart from Sinhalese and this convention announces to the world that the Republican Constitution of 1972 has made the Tamils a slave nation ruled by the new colonial masters, the Sinhalese who are using the power they have wrongly a spurt to deprive Tamil nations of its territory, language, citizenship, economic uh, life, and opposes of employment and education, thereby destroying all attributes of nationhood, 
of Tamil people. So this is a powerful statement which is in came in 1976. And uh, is it, uh, can you explain to us about this uh, political the 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 convention now have got this political rights. Uh, uh, all this right has been violated. So political, social, economic, and uh, religious, I think. So can you explain to us how the Sri Lankan government have violated those rights according to this statement? Yes. So um, it is uh, one of the uh, quite valuable things for us that uh, we have the records of Sri Lanka signing several agreements, um, which uh, are, are clearly being broken here in history in uh, the 1970s and are continuing to be broken today. Uh, these include the International Covenant on Civil and uh, Political Rights, the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, um, and, as well as the Apartheid Convention. Um, Article 1 of both the ICCPR and the ICESCR, um, Article 1 in both of them is the right of self-determination. Um, but uh, also uh, equally important is the fact that the right of self-determination is expressed in a number of other different rights, such as uh, the right to uh, have a citizenship, which was taken away from the upcountry Tamils, the right to participate in the economy, uh, the right to work, uh, which was taken away, uh, taken away from uh, Tamil civil servants when they were excluded from um, the uh, 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 participation uh, in the bureaucracy uh, through the Singla Only Act. The right to an education, which was denied to the uh, Tamil students in, in the 1970s through standardization. Um, and uh, what the effect of all of these things was, was to create a, exactly as the Vatikoti resolution says, a slave nation um, where the Singhala people group had advantages that the Tamil people group did not have access to. And uh, the separation between Singhala and Tamil in this way upheld the uh, the racist regime of Sri Lanka, and that is the crime of apartheid. So uh, there's a number of, uh, uh, of violations of treaties that Sri Lanka is party to that are recorded here in this history. So it's also explained, but uh, the convention also further declared that the Tamil Ulams has consist of uh, and it, it declares like a state what uh, what it should do and who are the citizenship and all that is being recorded here in the resolution. And then we come into the Tamilar Buddha Kutani. That's exactly the... right. Um, so when we, uh, we see that... Uh... You want to go back to that and explain to us how this is being done as a state, or if you want to convention further declares that the state of Tamilism consists of the people of northern and eastern uh, provinces. Yes, my, my connection is. Uh... Is it fine now? That's right. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, my connection is a little unstable. I'm, I'm getting the message. Uh, are, are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, in subparagraph A there, where uh, we see that the state of Tamil Elam shall consist of the people of the northern and eastern provinces, uh, full and equal rights of citizenship uh, to all Tamil-speaking uh, Tamil people living in any part of Ceylon, and Tamils of Elam origin living in any parts of the world. Um, so we have three categories of Tamil Elam citizenship. We have uh, the Tamil people uh, to whom the northern and eastern provinces of that day, uh, which uh, form the territory of Tamil Elam, belong. Um, we have all Tamil people, Tamil speaking people living in any part of Ceylon, 
This includes the upcountry Tamils. This includes Tamil speaking Muslims if they should choose to opt for citizenship of Tamil Elam. And then we have Tamils of Elam, Elam origin living in any part of the world. That is the diaspora. So already in, in the 1970s, we uh, have this definition of who belongs to Tamil Elam that uh, it's based on consent. It's based on people's free choice uh, to belong to Tamil Elam. And this is the definition that was voted on um, in, in the TULF election manifesto. And the second one is also a powerful one. That is the constitution of Tamil Elam shall be based on the principle of democratic decentralization so as to ensure that non-domination of any religious or territorial community of Tamil Elam uh, by any section. So this is very important for the Muslims, especially the, they fear that the, the, so that is also based here that uh, it, has, it will be decentralized, but it worked as a nation, but uh, as a state, but it will have decentralization rather than, it, it, this statement itself says that it's not a unitary state. Am I, is it right? Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, if uh, uh, we were to look even further into the document, uh, which we don't need to go into every every detail, mm. uh, but uh, this is only the the tip of the iceberg in how uh, religious as well as uh, other um, uh, uh, types of uh, groups within uh, Tamilism society would be protected. Um, so. Uh, the, the entire idea uh, behind uh, establishing Tamil Elam as a state is that it would not have any religion as having the foremost place. This is in the, the uh, founding documents of Tamil Elam. Yeah, indeed. Um, and in, indeed, is... it says that Tamil Elam shall be a secular state, giving equal protection and assistance to all religious, which, uh, all religions to which people of state may belong to. So that is, is, it says, is a secular state, and it doesn't prefer, it doesn't give any preference to a religion which is opposite to what 1972 constitution did of bringing uh, Buddha, Buddha Buddhism as the foremost religion in Sri Lanka. So that is right. that is the, uh, said that, and also that he talks about all the discrimination which uh, the, on the sea. So he says that the state of Tamilam. Uh, caste shall be abolished because and the observance of uh, penurious practice, untouchability or inequality of any type based on the birth shall be totally eradicated and observance uh, and observance in any form of uh, form punished by law. So. It's important to point out that uh, one of the first acts of the LTT when it formed the government of the state of Tamil Elam was to pass exactly such a law. The LTT outlawed caste discrimination, and uh, this is something that uh, is uh, swept under the rug in uh, many retellings of, of that history today. Yeah. And the Tamil language shall be the, uh, the language of the state but the right of single speaking minority, they also give single people in Tamil uh, to education, transition of their business in their language and shall be protected on the reciprocal basis of Tamil speaking minorities in the single state. Can you explain to us this, uh, this stanza? Uh, yes, uh, so, um... There uh, uh, was the the proposal that Tamil would be the language of Tamil Elam, um, but uh, that this would not be a form of discrimination against uh, Sinhalese people living in Tamil Elam. This uh, very clearly says that an independent Tamil Elam will live in harmony with the Sinhalese people. This uh, this is a very very clear indication of this. And uh, the legal protections uh, of the singular language within Tamil Elam would be uh, protected, as it says, on a reciprocal basis, basis 
with Tamil speaking minorities, minorities in the single estate, which means that those Tamils who are living uh, on the Sri Lanka side of the border um, would be protected by the negotiating power of Tamil Elam uh, that it would have by granting rights to the single speaking minorities within Tamil Elam. Okay. The Tamil shall be the uh, shall be a socialist days wherein exploitation of man by man shall be forbidden, and the dignity of labor shall be recognized, and uh, by the means of production and distribution shall be subject to public ownership and control, while permitting uh, private enterprise in those branches within the limit, limit prohibited uh, prescribed by law economic development shall be based on the socialist planning and there shall be a ceiling on the total wealth that any individuals of the family uh, may acquire so this is somebody this this document or this section is little bit questionable by Western or the, uh, or the democratic thinking that uh, is, it a, is it a sort of a Marxist uh, sort of uh, a principle or some sort of, uh, so will it have any effect on uh, if we have got similar concept or is it right? Well, um, uh, this uh, will take a little bit longer to explain, so please indulge me on this. But uh, I, I believe that this is basically uh, the correct position to take. I think that today we would uh, use different words to express the same thing. But uh, what we've seen is that uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia in particular, um, those societies that have prospered, uh, those societies that have done very well, um, are those societies where there is some sort of uh, concept of equality between people and specifically uh, equality uh, in terms of their economic rights. Um, so there are uh, there is a, a very good book uh, by Joe Studwell called How Asia Works. This has really influenced my thinking on this topic, uh, where he shows that um, in, in the societies where there was land redistribution, um, after World War II, these societies went on to do very well uh, in the decades that followed. Uh, whereas the societies that kept um, uh, land in, in the control of just a few very, very powerful individuals, uh, these societies went on to become dysfunctional and, and corrupt societies. Um, so while, uh, you know, uh, if, if we're speaking to a Western audience, we might want uh, to downplay the word socialist. Uh, we, we uh, you know, we might want to uh, not talk so much about um, the, uh, the history of uh, that word. We would want the concepts um, to apply in a sovereign and independent Tamil because these are the best ways to unleash the human potential when you have uh, economic equality and also have private enterprise, which is uh, also in paragraph F there, when you have these two things together, that is a formula for success. Um, let's not forget that during the Cold War, um, the, uh, the state of Tamil Elam uh, wa was uh, emerging in 1977, and it was very important to keep a balance between the West and the East. Um, I, I believe it's in the TULF election manifesto where it specifically states that Tamil Elam will be non-aligned in the Cold War. Um, so I, I believe that this is an important thing for us to keep in mind um, as uh, we look to the future for ourselves as well. Uh, that that is a great powerful powerful statement which we have been they have made it in particular resolution even before somebody accused them of like. Uh, uh, like uh, this are uh, bunch of uh, people who are doing some terrorist activities so this is this is not what it is they can't accuse uh, tlf or anybody of doing anything that they they are ready to build their nation at That's that right. time and they have proved that our nation existed before the colonization and then only in 1833 they have put all of them together so with that thing, 
is there any any uh, in 1833 i am going to come to this document that 18 until 1833 all the things has been maintained as separate as it is so if they might have maintained separate as it is uh then we we will not have had this problem because if we have got their own territories maintained maintain separately like by portuguese and holland uh, they maintain it separately only 1833 the british colbrook and uh, cameron commission so is there is any anything any recourse to that in the parliament because this uh british parliament which made this law of uh, because it's not uh, some lords sitting down in sri lanka uh, or ceylon at that time didn't make that it was the british parliament which uh, made the annexation possible and they they based it on britain where uh, the, the there are four nations are now you know, three nations are joined together like uh, england scotland and wales and northern ireland four nations uh, three nations are joined together so then now they are divided they, in other words they gave the parliament to scotland and uh, uh, they gave the assembly to uh, wales to maintain their this thing and even in this covid process they demonstrated that this four four nations uh, nations or whatever the uh, things are separate entities as it is they manage their things separately and there are laws which are governing so they, they even though within the unitary state of if you consider the britain as a unitary state but it's no longer a unitary state so but they formed a unitary state in sri lanka at that time in 1833 and the parliament was also involved so is there is any recourse uh, to this for any law courts in uh, uh, britain to say that this is because of the 1833 we are in this plight today so the britain should take more interest to uh, be on our side is there any sort of uh, recourse or is it not possible um this is a, a legally complicated question but i will explain it the best way that i can um so the first part of the complication is that the answer is no Uh, there's no recourse to uh, the British Parliament now, because decolonization of the island has happened. Uh, the uh, 1972 Constitution cut off the last ties uh, between um, Britain and the island, and so uh, uh, in in Britain's eyes, it has washed its hands of the matter, and uh, they're legally. But it, it was not the it was not. with the consent that is why 1972 it was not with the consent of tamils which the, they used their democratic or in other word majoritarian uh, power to do that the survey right. from that yeah and the That's tamil exactly. never agreed or they never supported as you said earlier they never supported the 1972 constitution and they have made it clear to the commonwealth on the 1974 letter that they don't support any of those So and uh, th this is uh, exactly why the doctrine of reversion to sovereignty is so important. Um I I will come back to that. I I do want to uh add one little piece of why the answer is no before going into what the possibilities are under law. Um so uh as I mentioned yes, the 1972 constitution it cuts that legal link between the the island and and the British parliament. the british parliament no longer has direct power to do anything on the island but um there's another legal doctrine that also comes into play uh which has a latin name uti possidetis uh what this means is that when the uh country becomes independent it is supposed to keep its colonial boundaries this is a very very strong argument in international law when we had the chagos islands decision that was against uh, the united kingdom which said that the chagos islands belong to mauritius um this was used in that doctrine of uti possidetis you cannot chop up um a colonial entity um and th there is no recourse against this except as you mentioned consent the right of self determination is based on consent and it lies higher in the uh the legal hierarchy than this other doctrine of keeping the colonial boundaries 
Self-determination can never be taken away in law. Uti possidetis can be taken away with the consent of the people. And we have exactly that consent in the Vatikote resolution. We have that exact consent in the uh, TULF election manifesto. And uh, we have the doctrine of reversion to sovereignty, which says that when the colonizer withdraws, the old kingdoms come back and the people decide what they want to do. The, the people of the kingdoms of Kota and Kandy after 1972 decided that they were going to be uh, renamed Sri Lanka. The people of the Tamil kingdom in the north and east decided that they were going to form their own separate state of Tamililam. That is what happened. But uh, the, the, the British parliament, uh, we, we cannot have recourse to them. Uh, we do have the doctrines of self-determination and reversion to sovereignty. Okay. So, but they can still support the, the uh, uh, support the the independence of Tamils in uh, in this by uh, because they are under genocide. They can recognize genocide. They don't have to go into Sri Lanka to do that because Sri Lanka is uh, they never treated the people who left in their hands uh, the same way. They want to take the whole island by. Uh, like they acting like a colonizers rather than uh, acting like uh, anybody else. They won't. They, they they are so. This is where we are. We had to may whatever in law, international law may not be that. Uh, but on the other hand, the we should emphasize to the British Parliament and British parliamentarian that this all these are the policies followed by the uh, those times and then it, they should have a moral high ground or moral uh, duty it cannot be a moral uh, this thing to support the tamil cause or tamil national questions yeah. i completely agree with you um i i would like to bring up something that uh was often brought up uh maybe about a year ago um, when uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia was happening, the ambassador of Kenya said that uh, we in, in Africa, in our history, uh, we did not like the boundaries that the colonizers had drawn, but we accepted them in order uh, to keep the peace amongst ourselves. Because if we had tried to change these borders, there would have been war. And this was quoted at Tamils saying, look, see, this is why you shouldn't ask for an independent state, because it's going to cause war. This is a false argument when it's applied to us. It's being kept inside the same state, deprived of all citizenship, social and economic rights. It, uh, and as the Vatikote resolution has said, being turned into a slave nation, this is what caused the war. So uh, in the uh, advancement of peace, in the advancement of stability for the region, a separate Tamil state is going to be better uh, as an outcome than preserving these colonial boundaries. And this is exactly why self-determination is higher in, in law than this other doctrine of keeping the colonial boundaries. So we are, you are put in the annex of uh, uh, Tamil United Liberation Front election manifesto, July 1977. And then uh, you are included that because it has got the documentation of how the Tamil states and the laws uh, like uh, colonization and uh, it talks about language, it talks about religion, it talks about culture, it talks about education and uh, it talks about employment opportunities and it talks about economic development of Tamilulam and uh, race, racial terrorism uh, and uh, New constitution on Tamililam imposition of the constitution on that is 1972 constitution. And does the Tamil nation have an alternative? And then Tamililam following citizenship, following shall be the citizens of uh, Tamililam. They they give us the, all the all the documentation. This is this is how the Tamililam will be formed. So that TLF manifesto clearly state that on that. Then you are coming to the Annex 3. So why did you include this Annex 3? Can you explain to us? 
Yes. So um, the question uh, would certainly arise if the ICC was going to take this uh, uh, application or this accession seriously. The question would certainly arise as to does TGTE have the right to submit this document? Um, because uh, uh, any person can claim to represent a state, but what is the le legitimacy of that claim? Um, this shows the history of why the TGTE was created uh, after 2009, what its purpose was, that uh, it was voted on by the diaspora um, as uh, the, the government, and uh, that therefore it has the authority to represent Tamililam at the International Criminal Court. Uh, th that was the point of this document. So this uh, says about the formation of TDD, how that is the formation document, which uh, and also how the TDD is formed and uh, how it is uh, so it's taking a and, uh, and also it also comes in with uh, who have done uh, because this had to be done in a, this accession document had to be done in a proper manner. So That's they right. have put it under the TGT's um, cabinet. So the document passed through the cabinet on the on the 26th of eight, 2022. And the, at that meeting, who was there and it tells that who was present at that meeting and who took all this, the decision to uh, send the document to the uh, International Criminal Court to accept the jurisdiction of International Criminal Criminal Court on the uh, on the uh, territories of Tamil. So, so this is what is uh, uh, stated in Tamil. It says that TGT's application to accede the jurisdiction of the ICC. Uh, yeah. The Sarvadesa Kutavial, Nidhi Mandratin, Nyaya, Ayadikatinai, Eto Kolvadil, Arasiel Utiayam, other Kana, Vunapatin, Viverangalayam, Pradamar Vulakinar, and the meeting the TGT Nodea Amateur by Kuta Kutatila Vulakinar. Adanai Todan the Pala Urupinarkal, Sarvadesa Kutia Miran, Nidi Mandrat the Kanapaula, Avana of Krit, Tamada Karatakalai, Terivitargal, Rudil, Sarvadesa Kutia Miran, Nidi Mandratin, Nia Yatkatai, Etukolum, Buna Patai, Erha Madaha, Amateur Vay Etukunda. This is the and in the Srapu, Amateur Vay Kutatin Arike, Sandari Munmolia, Jekumar Balimolia. This is in English. The, term, the Prime Minister explained the political advantage of acceding to the jurisdiction of International Criminal Court. The cabinet members expressed their point of view on the document that is to be submitted to ICC. With the, this is a document which has been already submitted to ICC. The cabinet unanimously accepted that assenting to the jurisdiction of the ICC is a good strategy. The minutes of this special cabinet meeting were accepted as accurate and proposed by Sandini Sivaraman and uh, seconded by Jay Kumar. So then this is the, that's the um, uh, cabinet uh, uh, minutes and then we come into formation document which is the which uh, which I will. okay now we want to ask the uh, question okay so accepting the jurisdiction of ICC what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages for a Tamil people as uh, such and what are the advantages? It, okay, if they accept that, uh, because we are a separate nation, and uh, so, so what are the advantages of doing that? All right. Um, so uh, the the question of being a separate nation, I'll come to that second. 
the first and most immediate advantages are that we will be engaging with the accepted international legal machinery to bring Sri Lankan war criminals to justice. Um, I mean, we have examples, for example, uh, the state of Israel, where uh, they did not go to an international tribunal. They declared their own state. They then went around the world uh, with their intelligence service, kidnapped Nazis and tried them and hung them in uh, uh, the state of Israel. Um, this is a controversial strategy. Uh, nobody's advocating that for Tamil Ulam. What we're saying is that we want to follow the established due process of international legality to do this the right way to, uh, to show that we are uh, the, the, the people on the island who are upholding the, the international standards of uh, legal process. Um, and in the process, by doing this, we'll also uh, have a, a certain personal sense of, of justice that uh, those who have killed our relatives, those who have driven us from our homeland, are being uh, tried and sentenced uh, in according with the norms of law. So then the second part is um, whether the ICC would uh, accept us, uh, our jurisdiction, uh, excuse me, accept uh, Tamil Ilum's accession to its jurisdiction. Um, I don't feel very optimistic about this at the moment. Um, I think that, that is something that will take a very long time. Um, however, we do have precedent of an unrecognized state uh, that was then recognized. And because of that recognition, uh, the ICC gained jurisdiction over its territory. That's Palestine. There's problems with Palestine. We, we know that the Palestinian leadership uh, has had close ties with the Rajapaksa clan. Um, this isn't uh, to say that everything that Palestine does is a model for Tamil Ilum by any means. But in this particular case, they found the way through. And this was by gaining recognition at the UN General Assembly. Through that recognition, uh, the ICC uh, gained jurisdiction over its territory. Okay, so uh, so the, there's a question that, okay, there are in the international reports, now they are saying, um, it's had been always said that uh, uh, not only the Sri Lanka has committed war cr crimes, the LTT also did war crimes. So by bringing that into the territory of uh, Tamil Ulam, the access to the territory of Tamil Ulam, Will there be any any uh, issues regard to Tamil uh, combatants and Tamil, uh, especially the LTT uh, uh, accusations? So if, will they be also come into the prosecution if that happens? So I, I want to begin by saying that uh, the accusations against the LTT must be proven in a court of law. Until then, these are only accusations. Um, and in order to have that happen, justice needs to be uh, established in some sort of forum, whether that be an ad hoc tribunal, whether that be a hybrid tribunal, whether that be the ICC. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, and the reason for that is in the quote that uh, Rajapaksa, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa gave, to Stephen Rapp, which we heard about uh, maybe two years ago or so, where uh, Stephen Rapp, ambassador of, of the US, they asked uh, Gotabaya, why didn't you try the LTT leaders? Why did you kill them? And uh, Gotabaya answered, uh, well, trials, they go on for so long and people get off. I killed them, I killed them, I killed them. So w when we break this down, what uh, Gotabaya was actually saying, trials go on for so long, that is due process. That is what you need to determine whether someone is guilty or innocent. That takes time. This is exactly what I meant earlier when I said that Tamil Lilam wants to follow due judicial process. We don't want sham trials and then executions to make people, uh, uh, everyone feel good. What we want is to follow procedure. Gotabaya didn't want that for the LTTE. Then he said, and people get off. This means he knows that most of the accusations leveled against the LTT are false. It's a simple fact that uh, the accusations that uh, have been leveled against the LTTE 
are largely exaggerations and fabrications. Gotabaya himself knows that, and he was afraid that this could be proven in court. And then finally, we have the fact that uh, Sri Lanka was given the option by the international community to set up its hybrid tribunal, partly Sri Lankan judges, partly international judges. Sri Lanka to this day has refused to do this, even though the international community was against the LTTE, even though the international community would have accepted a hybrid uh, court that only tried LTTE members with maybe one or two sacrificial lambs uh, from the Sri Lankan armed forces. It could have been done, and Sri Lanka chose not to do it because they knew that this would backfire against them. Law is not on Sri Lanka's side. Law is on our side. Oh, that's good. And how are you going to proceed? What are the, uh, how you are going to proceed with this? Uh, because you already submitted the document. So how we are going to uh, force or we are going to encourage uh, ICC to take this matter seriously and how we are going to do that or how the, what, what the Tamils can contribute or what others can contribute to uh, move this process forward. So um, we have a, a number of lobbyists who go to the UN Human Rights Council every year. Uh, that's in Geneva. They're in contact with diplomats from uh, uh, around the world. Um, and this can now be used in our lobbying, that we are willing to submit to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court uh, in order to have some sense of justice for what has been done to us. Um, and. Uh, these, uh, these diplomats are uh, human beings just like the rest of us. Um, they have a sense of justice, but they also have a sense of duty to their country's interests. Uh, we have the sense of duty to our own country's interests, the country Tamil Ilam. Uh, they have the sense of duty to each of their countries. But um, in our conversations with these diplomats, uh, it needs to be shown that, that we have tried the, the route of human rights. We have tried the route of democratic vote. We have tried the route even of armed struggle. We have tried the route of uh, uh, appealing to uh, the international community's sense of humanity. None of that has worked. And Sri Lanka still has not been held accountable. Sri Lanka still refuses to sign the Rome Statute, even though it has been asked to. It still hasn't set up a, a hybrid tribunal, even though it's been asked to. And so this is our way of showing our good faith to the international community, that all we want is justice. Thank you very much for the long conversation we had with you, Lorenzo. You took your time and the precious time and the, then you are helping this document to go through and also a uh, few words on self-determination. How This is one of the ways, but uh, there are other ways which we can try self-determination as well. So if you can tell us a little bit on that side of things, and then we'll finish this, wrap it up. All right, yes. So um, it has been uh, a demand of the, the Tamil people to have a referendum um, on self-determination ever since 2009. Uh, when I first came into uh, uh, the, this, uh, this movement, I was uh, 30 years old in uh, 2011, and I was told, Genocide recognition and self-determination through referendum. Like uh, that's that's what we stand for. Um, I don't think that that has changed. Uh, but uh, in order to have a referendum, what we've seen in recent history as well as uh, more uh, uh, ancient history, uh, going back to the 1800s, is that countries only get their independence when it's in the interest of other countries that they become independent. Um, when you try and uh, do it alone, um, you may have some certain amount of success, but eventually the international community is stronger than you. So it's very important to establish common interests between ourselves and the countries that uh, have the power to give the thumbs up or thumbs down. I don't only mean the powerful countries. I don't only mean uh, you know, the, the, the very key players in the international system, but also smaller countries who have votes uh, at, at the UN. Um, because when we call for a referendum as a people, we can keep calling for it um, without anything happening. We've already had the vote of 1977. At that time, we were not on the international community's radar. 
At that time, this was a question between us and Sri Lanka. Today, this is an international matter. There are international stakeholders. There are uh, players now that are not even countries. They're investment firms and uh, uh, private equity funds that have an interest in what happens on the island. If we can show that we can give a better deal by being a separate country, one that would be prosperous and peaceful, um, we will get our country. And one way to ratify that one way to put the stamp of approval on that through democratic processes is a referendum. But the groundwork needs to be put in place before that. It, uh, it doesn't require a referendum, but what it does require is cooperation with key members from the international community. Thank you very much. I, I think we will proceed further and I hope this uh, document will uh, also, as you said earlier, about uh, lobbying with the diplomats and others uh, and how legally we are moving forward. And these are all one of the avenues of uh, moving toward justice and accountability. So I hope that we will continue to do that and uh, best of luck with uh, all the other projects you are in and uh, we soon get our Tamil back. Uh, thank you very much for taking part in this uh, discussion. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have this discussion and thank you for inviting me. I look forward to next time. Thank you very much.